Hello everyone. My name is uh, Vikas Agrawal and I am the founder of a company called AIF and PMS Experts India. Well, AIF is nothing but your alternate investment funds and PMS is a portfolio management services. Uh, so we are emerging as one of the largest platform for investing in alternate investments and portfolio management services. So you know, at AIF and PMS Experts India, we keep organizing these knowledge-based sessions. And the whole idea of these sessions, organizing, I mean, the whole idea of, of organizing this session is to give you more perspective about what's happening in an economy, what's happening around the world, and at the same time, give you more perspective about different fund managers uh, and their thought process. Uh, so therefore, we call this show as Ask the Expert Show. So welcome to the brand new Ask the Expert Show. This time is a very special time because with me, I have Mr. Ashish Goel. He's a managing partner and principal officer at Invest Savvy. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's quite, it's quite uh, it, it took me quite some time to sort of invite him on my platform, but I'm glad that um, he has agreed to come in and uh, speak to all of you, uh, uh, my dear investors. So, so Ashish, uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for accepting our request and taking the time. No, the pleasure is mine. Thank you. So, uh, let me just have a, a, a minute of your to, as to introduce Ashish first. Uh, his absolute pleasure, uh, pleasure of mine to kind of introduce him. Uh, well, I know Ashish, I follow him on various social media and, and then he comes on CNBC more often. Uh, uh, but however, uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll quickly introduce. So he holds a degree, he's a BTEC from IIT Kanpur. He's also studied from IIM Kolkata. He did his MBA and then he further went to do his MS in uh, computer uh, uh, computational finance uh, from Carne Mellon University. Uh, so this is one of the most reputed universities in across the globe. And then uh, he has, so he brings about almost two and a half decades of experience uh, having worked in domestic as well as overseas markets. So he's worked in Singapore, UK and US uh, with one of, with, 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 you know, very large institutions, some of the hedge funds also like Saffron that he's is, is, is worked there, out there. Uh, and in India, he's worked with ICC Bank and Standard Chartered, worked very closely, MD and head of micro sales. Uh, so he was heading the uh, micro sales uh, as an MD uh, out there. So he's, he was, but he was very passionate about equities and that made him to start this fund. So his fund featured in top five funds for 2023 by money control, giving 80% returns in 2023 and has been consistently outperforming the benchmark quarter on quarter. So it's like a top quartile PMS that he runs. Uh, so apart from this, uh, he's, he's married with two kids. He enjoys traveling and traveling gives him more wisdom to sort of think think differently. Uh, so he believes in solving a lot of puzzles all the time when he's free. Uh, and he, 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 of course, prefer to play uh, bridge and, and likes to eat a lot of food. Uh, so with that, uh, you know, today's topic is we want to start the session. The topic is it's beyond uh, uh, the so-called uh, the four boxes that you click. It's beyond investing is beyond the rules and paradigm, you know. So idea is to uh, understand uh, he, and read his mind and and understand the kind of wisdom that he got to share with all of us. So I'm really looking forward for this session. So once again, thank you for, for accepting the request, Ashish. My pleasure is mine. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in. Uh, clearly, equity markets have been, uh, and India have been very much in uh, every on everyone's mind of late, especially with the kind of spectacular returns which people have been getting. Uh, now, let me just take a step back and let's look at, uh, you know, I always believe it's good to first do a 30,000 feet view and then zoom into where you are going. That kind of gives you a larger perspective to where you are. So uh, at the risk of you knowing some of this, let me talk about a few things. First, let's talk about at a macro level, why India? Now, India clearly is a growth spot on the global uh, you know, set up. Uh, we are also getting benefit of China plus one. The the government has had a lot of policies and has been uh, investing in infrastructure. There's a huge push for di digitization. All these things obviously feed into, uh, you know, like if you have a GST structure, which is now working well. Uh, so all these things kind of feed into growth in the long run and make markets more scalable. 
because always developed markets have people have this issue around uh, third world countries or emerging markets uh, that uh, you know uh, is the regulation okay you know is infrastructure fine and all those things so india has been really investing in that uh, the demographics for india are great so you've got a large young growing population and also amongst that so you have skilled labor at one end and the, at the other point you also have a rising affluent population now you know right now we have about 60 million people who are earning more than 10000 dollars a year but in another uh, you know a study by goldman says that in the next 3 to 4 years that number is going to rise to 10 100 million uh, people so 10 crore people now the point is if you have that many affluent people coming in there is a consumption story which will pick up uh, obviously as i said stable government and regulatory environment and being well placed globally helps and one point which is more uh, data based is that for the other three economies which have hit uh, 5 trillion uh, you know gdp they have had the largest bull run between 2 million to 5 oh, sorry 2 trillion to 5 trillion gdp growth so if you look at china it took 5 years to go from 2 billion 2 trillion to 5 trillion and they grew four times the markets the equity markets grew four times at a compounded rate of 30% us took 11 years from 1977 to 1988 it grew 15 times again at a uh, compounded rate of 30% and japan took eight and a half years and it grew 14 times at a compounded rate of 40%. So India, if it is going down that route, clearly has a decent way to go. We've actually only grown, say, at around 11 to 12% CAGR since we hit 2 trillion. So if we are to get anywhere close to 25, we are in for a huge uh, bull run even going forward now. So now, so that's why India. Now let's look at the setup in India. So what are the asset classes? You have debt. Now debt pro, pros are like whether it be mutual funds or savings accounts, they are predictable. You have your principal, which is mostly protected if you're not taking any credit risk. You get your money anywhere between T plus zero, which is for savings account to T plus three or four on various debt funds. So it's fairly quickly available. And it is obviously required for payments, so people will keep some money in savings accounts, et cetera, though cards can replace it. But on the cons, you know, it is hugely tax inefficient. In fact, under the new regulations, even debt, mutual funds, et cetera, which you, or FMPs, et cetera, which used to be a lot more tax efficient, have actually uh, become uh, not so efficient anymore. And they do not cover inflation. So it's basically, you know, you are going to lose money in the long run. So ideally, even if you want to invest, you should be mindful of what you're getting into. You will definitely lose money in real terms if you put money in debt uh, over the long run. Uh, next is you know, real estate. Yes, it's a physical asset. You can use it. Uh, it typically in the long run covers for inflation, but the cons are that you know it's illiquid, requires large ticket size, plus there is a cash element to it in quite a few of the places which is difficult to handle. Uh, people got stuck in demonetization with cash on uh, real estate transactions and there was a lot of problems which people faced. And frankly, the new millennial may not want to get into that mess. Uh, there is always issues of legal issues like somebody could have paperwork not being there and a whole host of those issues as well as possession and all. It's not as tax efficient as equities or others. and illiquidity is so extreme it can take you three months to a year to sell or maybe even more so that's there but again at least it covers for inflation you have yeah, commodity you like to share some slide here ashish or no uh, okay i'll just share a quick slide yes you wish to yeah yeah i'll just show the slide here sure so can you see it yes yes if you look at uh, equities now, equities has the advantage that, uh, you know, you have uh, growth potential because number of investors in India is growing. India, by the way, has only 4% of the population investing in equity. Uh, and globally, if you look at developed markets, it's anywhere between 40 to 50% of the people. 
Uh, you have to take it with a pinch of salt because not that many affluent people are there and all that. But still, you know, you have a large way to go. Uh, you have higher allocation coming into equity. The new generation EPFOs are investing. So a lot of money is coming into equity. It is tax efficient. And if SEBI gets to T plus one right now, but if it gets to T plus one R, you could actually have it in a place of a savings account as well. You need money, just sell it. You have your money in your account in an R and you can then use it for whatever you need. Uh, cons are volatility and risk of capital in, uh, erosion, especially in the short run and risk appetite. Not everyone is cut out for, say, you know, seeing a portfolio drop of 10, 20%. It happens in others also, like debt and uh, like in real estate and commodities. But there in real estate, people do not really revalue their house often. Gold, jewelry, et cetera, is lying there. People, again, don't revalue it that often. So uh, here, everyone seems to be on some web app or something and constantly monitoring their MTM every day. So that's one thing. Now, let me come to, so amongst these, I think if you are having a five years plus horizon, equities definitely looks to be a good option because uh, it has proven time and again to beat the other asset classes, especially debt uh, in terms of long-term wealth creation. The, I, I still say uh, sovereign gold bonds are a good option to have some of the money in. Real estate also can be there, but you need to be very careful you're built for that and all. Uh, now let's look at, if you are looking at equities, and I'm talking about it as an, any investor. It doesn't need to be a fund manager. Even when I was a student and I was investing, some things I would always keep in mind. You always try and get into some stock, identify a stock where there's a compelling story or a more. So firstly, you should always look at having a strong reason to uh, invest and then carry out relative valuation. You should always try to understand why you are investing in a stock. So, you know, even if somebody tells you, I want to, you know, this stock is very good and you should invest, please keep in mind that unless and until you yourself are convinced, you will not be able to make the most of your investment. So always try and understand what you're getting into. We do an intrinsic valuation after that, where we get into much more detail and get a margin of safety for the stock. And finally, we look at technical analysis to assist our decision. So the decision is always based on fundamentals, but once you've decided, you can use technical analysis to decide the timing a little bit. But believe me, in equity markets, nobody really gets the timing right, irrespective of how adept the person is. Uh, you know, there's always a piece of chance there. So we believe get in right fundamentally and invest. And in the medium to long run, it will be a good investment. Now, let's look at the rules and sometimes beyond. So what happens is, uh, if you look at uh, people say, okay, you know, you should follow rules and uh, rules for investing are important. Yes, rules for investing are important, no doubt about it. So we normally say that you should invest in uh, value stocks because our experience has been, especially when the market isn't going uh, crazy shooting up, value stocks generally tend to do better than very highly priced stocks. Also, uh, you know, like for example, Twitter, which, uh, you know, listed in 2013, did really well as a company, but was a poor investment because over 10 years, they literally gave no return. So because all the growth was already priced in. Uh, then next, you we look at debt. So, but having said that, sorry, coming back, Having said that, one sometimes does have opportunities where there is very high PE and you still make great returns on the stock because the stock story was very strong or the and earnings were exploding. So the PE was there. So it's not, don't stick to a rule permanently. It's like you need to evaluate why the rule is there. Now, debt, sometimes low debt means longevity for uh, through downturns. So we generally would prefer low debt companies. But what you also see is that sometimes in cases of turnaround or in cases where the company has gone through a tough patch and has got badly beaten, 
uh, even though debt could be high and the company is in a tough spot, those could actually be some of the best investment uh, opportunities. For example, CG Power was hugely leveraged, was going through a really tough time. And when we bought the stock, and that stock has gone more than 40 times uh, in the last three years. So, and when we got into it, PE was crazy uh, or non existent as a negative, and your uh, debt was sky high, but you know, it did give very, very good returns. Uh, flexibility in size, don't be bound by any particular size. So, we believe you should invest where there is value, whether it be small cap, micro cap, or large cap. You need to be convinced that there is value in the stock. Margin of safety is a rule I think we always like to stick to because, uh, uh, you know, it does give you some, uh, you know, comfort. Having said that, it is for very high growth stocks, sometimes it's difficult to uh, gauge that what is the rate at which you are getting in. But those are basically some of the rules and how, you know, you might have a difference to that. Now, let me come to some special situations because, you know, rules do have uh, cases and this is like not just rules. This is something stepping outside rules. So, for example, a lot of times you have cases where there are mergers. So, a swap ratio has been defined and you like one company. So, for example, we had bought into Kirloskar Ferris and we like this stock. And then the merger with ISMT was announced and the swap ratio came out and we were looking at the two stocks. What we did was we would look at the relative value of both the stocks at the time of investing. And what we found at one point was that there was a significant discount which was there on ISMT vis-a-vis -vis Kirloskar. So we moved all our investment into ISMT. Later, we saw the situation reverse. So Kirloskar went from 250 to 400. Whereas ISMT, which was at a 5% discount when we got into 250, went to a 5% uh, premium when it got to 400. So not only did we capture the move from 250 to 400, we got an additional 10% because we got into ISMT 5% cheaper and got out 5% higher. So those are things you should keep in mind. And these things keep happening. So keep a view out on that, especially if you're bullish on the stock. While people can say play IDFC first bank versus IDFC also, but keep this in mind, it helps. Uh, then sometimes there are regulatory changes, like there was an export duty, which was uh, applied on all steel products in, two, uh, in May 22. Now we had a stock which was into exports and the stock fell literally 45% uh, from where it was within three, four days, because everyone thought that, you know, they used to export so much, they'll go to, they'll go bust. Now we had a chat with the management. We redrew the entire, uh, you know, revised cash flows and everything. And what we realized was that that price was absolutely crazy. So once the price stabilized, we actually started buying in and doubled our position. And that stock is three and a half times or three times where we start, we bought in the second time. So overall, not only did we make about 70% on where we had gotten originally, but because we averaged, our return is more than 150% on that stock. So you should always understand if there is market, you know, paranoia or uh, insanity creeping in. Uh, separately, sometimes you can have tactical plays. If raw material prices fall very sharply, then you can look at uh, the sector because then EBITDAs would improve if they can keep the part of the gains and that can actually lead to huge gains. So we entered into tire sector at that point when you know rubber prices fell sharply and we literally saw prices go three to four times from where they were. So that was a huge gain. And you know you always have to keep looking at where the next opportunity is. In case of CG Power, there was a management change. There was a restructuring happening. There was a turnaround on. So, you know, it made a lot of sense to take it. But these bets, you have to be cautious because they can go wrong as well. You have to do a lot of research and also put in only to the extent where your risk appetite allows you. You cannot invest in this in the same way you would say in a large cap 
because here there is a risk that things can go wrong. And especially for retail investors, you need to be even more careful because you may not have that kind of access to management, plant sites, you may not have that kind of time. Uh, a brief about our performance. So we've basically given, this is for January, We've since inception, we've been given 56% return as against Nifty being at 14% IRR and uh, BSE being at uh, BSE 500 being at 18.9 and our one year return was 95%. So, you know, we've been lucky to some extent and, you know, luck sometimes favors people who work harder. So I would not take all the credit for the growth, but I would also not take, give all the credit to luck. It's a mix of them. And uh, this is a performance. Uh, in conclusion, I would say, there is a lot of optimism about the India story. I can talk for an hour on how bullish I am on India and why. Uh, rules are important, but what is more important is you understand why that rule is there. Because if you understand why that rule is there, then in a specific case, you can assign a premium and say that, okay, in this case, yes, this rule is being not followed, but there is a premium I will get on it or you know, let's say you say P is a rule which you follow. P may be high, but you are saying the company is turning around this quarter or this year the profit is low, but in the forward P, it is, you know, justifiable. So, you know, understand where the rule stands for and why you are going against it. The rules are good for no initial investment, but as you get more adept at it, you need you start making the nuances between why the rule was there and why you can actually deviate from it. Perfect timing is a myth. Nobody gets it. You know, I've been in the markets for 25 plus years. I've seen the best of uh, equity experts. In public, obviously, nobody says that, you know, they don't get time. Everyone seems to be, a lot of people say, oh, we get it right. You know, that's what we are here for. We don't necessarily get it right all the time. But the point is, if you work hard and since if you're into it, firstly, if you stay invested and you're in the right stocks, Sooner or later, you will uh, bounce back. And two, you know, staying invested is very important. So I think, you know, I'll wrap it up here and leave it for, for Vikas to take over. Yeah, so you want to uh, try and understand and read your mind that how did you manage to create this kind of... Okay. Uh, so, see, one thing I would say, uh, I never say that, you know, and... Anybody who's investing with us, we do not want them to come in with an expectation that they will continue to get 70, 80% annualized returns. Uh, what you do is you do your research, you work hard, you watch out in the market, uh, keep constant eye out for opportunities and invest in right companies. The thing is, if you have, I don't have to invest in 500 companies. And, you know, in a particular month, I basically need to at max identify one or two good companies, which look to be, you know, after the whole funneling process. So I look at maybe 10, 15 companies and then drill down and come down to another three, four, and then maybe finally boil down to one or two companies, which I really like. But I don't need to go for 500 companies. So the company I pick, I better be sure I like it. Now, if you like, companies, if you've invested in good companies, medium to long term, they will give good returns. Uh, I typically try to invest in companies where I understand where the growth and profitability is coming in from. So if I get into a very large conglomerate where there are 100 different contributors, then I am a bit circumspect because, you know, then I may not be able to plot the trajectory at all or get the cash flows right or, you know, understand the whole business very well. So I typically like to understand the businesses I get into. Uh, and I'm okay not getting into a business which I don't understand, even if it is a good business. You know, at least, because what helps is that when the chips are down, if you understand the business, you at least have conviction on the turnaround of that, right? Market does have volatility swings and all. And if you are in the right stocks, and that's why if you're there in medium to long term, you will gain. Now, personally, my own investments, you know, my fund has been there for a shorter period of time, but even over the last 10, 15 years where I've actually been tracking it 
meticulously because earlier we didn't really have the tra tools to track you know everything on dividend and all so last 15 years we've now had tools where you can put in everything and you get literally exact returns so one has made a fairly good like 25 30 percent plus returns on an irr basis which has been pretty good and definitely beats inflation and debt but my point is you know invest and the good thing is if you start early you lose uh, when you have very little to lose and you have your learning on small ticket sizes and by the time you get to say 30 35 when you start investing seriously you've already had a learning which has come in cheap if you start at 35 you're going to lose a lot to learn the same lesson so that's why i always encourage people to start early in 10, 15 years, you might even decide, look, boss, this is not for me. I would rather invest with professionals and do my job. But, you know, then you have that time and everything with you. Or you might just develop it as a passion and say, look, I do a better job than a lot of them. So I want to open my own fund. Obviously, it's not that simple. I've been uh, handling funds since 2000 odd. So I, you know, I used to handle all FIIs and talk to Goldman and Morgan Stanley and all and have detailed discussions on equities, et cetera, for 25 years. So it's not that, you know, you open it like that, but so that I was carrying it a bit far, but yes, direct equity investments is something which I do encourage people to do. Okay, great, great. So can you also talk to us about uh, what kind of investment commitments that you look at before onboarding any clients uh, and uh, uh, what kind of team structure that you have at the moment? So, see, I uh, look at uh, a typical, so normally we do not, we prefer clients who have a five-year horizon. Reason being that in any growth story that we invest in, uh, while some of them pay off much earlier than expected, uh, sometimes it takes time. So, I split my investments into tactical and momentum-based and long-term. So long-term could be three to five years, whereas tactical could be six months to two years. So again, I don't look at one month, two months, because that I think is, you know, yes, there are people who say they can get it right. Believe me, I haven't seen any, and I've hired and interviewed people also who said they get it right. And when they come in, they say, you find that, you know, uh, you seldom get it right. So, uh, and trading is more for income. Uh, investment is more for wealth creation. So trading can pay for your trip to, you know, some holiday or something. But if you want to buy a villa, then you need to invest. You can't trade. And, or at least a lot of people I know don't. Now, so I look at a three to five year commitment. In terms of team, uh, I like to focus most of my investment and uh, effort into uh the team which is managing investments. So on research and investment, because I we've actually outsourced uh, our back office to Novama because therein we've got the best in class uh, back office. We've got the best in class, uh, you know, system for uh, slicing and dicing your portfolio. All our investors get the best back office and reporting, et cetera, which is there. And I don't have to spend an arm and a leg on that. Maybe at some point, once we are like, you know, a few years down the line, I might want to bring that in house. But as of now, the amount of investments they are doing as a small, uh, you know, setup, we would not be able to do that kind of investments. So that bit, and, I, and that is something which is non-core to us, right? So you have a 15 member team who handles that, that's fine. Uh, but what we do do is work smart. So you have a team of four or five research people in-house, but you also have access to 25 people, uh, uh, research analysts in Novama. You have access to research analysts in other broker firms. So whenever you want to pick up something, first you have a chat. So if you like something, it can be top-down or bottom-up. We do a sector uh, study ourselves. Then we have a chat with the sector uh, analyst, specialist in some of these firms. Therein you get whatever there is to get at a macro level and also whatever they like 
After that, we can bounce off our ideas, discuss stuff. And then if we like it, then we go deep into the company. Then we will talk with the management. We will do full DCF analysis. We'll read up everything there is to read about, you know, the call, con call transcripts. We go back to get a sense that, you know, does the management actually deliver? So everyone has their style, right? Some people will say 100 and deliver 150. Some people will say 150 and deliver 100. So the point is that if you go through previous con calls, transcripts, et cetera, you get a sense that, okay, this is a management which under promises and over delivers. And this is a management which over promises and under delivers. So you can actually then take their statements with a, you know, a normalization, if I can say, of the personality. And you get news and, uh, find out a lot about it. We even talk to people who are experts in the area. So sometimes, you know, there are people who have been CEOs and now let's say they are on the board or they have actually moved on and they have really the on the ground, like, you know, they've really grown through the industry. So they can actually tell you what actually happens. Like I'll give you an example. I was talking to uh, a person who was a CEO in one of the large uh, cement companies. Because at one point uh, when this whole Adani mess happened, I was looking at, uh, you know, Gujarat Ambuja, which had just been taken over and it looked attractive. What I realized was that in the cement industry, you make my, the demand is inelastic because it's three, four percent of the total expense, two to three percent. So you will not build a project because cement has become cheaper and you will only use that much cement as is required. But what happens is that if the industry is at loggerheads. Everyone is building capacity. If the main players are not looking at, sitting on the same table, you will never have a pricing which is profitable for everyone. And at that point, we saw that Adani's and Birla's don't sit on the same table. So therefore, then the sector cannot prosper beyond normal. So we gave it up. So yeah. it's insight like these which you don't get on the street, right? So it is sometimes these things which make the difference between what you see and what you don't. And right. a company can be a great company, but not a great investment. A paints for that matter. Great company. I have great respect for them. But they're in a sector where you have Grassen coming in. You have JSW coming in. You have existing players fighting for survival. And you had a monopoly position. So you were priced as a monopoly key market player. Now, either the new guys will come in and they have deep pockets. So either they will... They will try to disrupt the market. So either you will lose market share or you will lose margin. Either case, the price will not go up. Your profits will not suffer. So it's a great company, but may not be a great investment. And like last two years, that's what we've seen. It's been pretty stable compared to the rest of the market. Yeah. So do you also pick up uh, uh, some themes and what kind of percentage you have as technical allocation and what is it that you look at from long-term point of view? That's question number one. And two is, do you pick up themes or you, you I mean, you do a complete bottom-up and then that becomes a part of the theme which is running in. See, as I said, equity investing is no rules beyond a point. So at any point of time, I never have this that, okay, this is 50% here, 50% there. It depends on how attractive an opportunity is looking on momentum play, how, how attractive opportunity is in long-term growth. Is. I personally would, so we have a churn ratio, even in the current market, we have a churn ratio of about 60.6. So we keep it low. But at the same time, the idea is that it depends on how good we like the idea is. And it can be top-down or bottom-up. So sometimes there are companies which come in and see, you know, people try to say that, you know, this is bottom up is different and top down is different. If you really look at it, the really good ideas are when top down and bottom up come together to the same place, right? When you have a great company in a great sector with large, you, you know, very good tailwinds and little headwinds. So the sector is well placed and the company is, you know, doing, uh, you know, set up for growth. That's when the, you know, you get... Uh, the real kicker. So having said that, typically, I would say anywhere between 50 to 70% of our portfolio, I would like to keep in growth, which is long term. And the rest 30 to 50% is in companies which we would possibly buy and sell. But there again, it's six months to a year. 
so it's not like immediate and uh, you know so we like to give it time so that's exactly. it. and we use both bottom up and top down so sometimes we like certain themes and sometimes we like certain companies so we might meet a company we are really impressed by so what really excites me is when i see a company which is put in capex and the revenues are slated to you know really grow uh, huge now and that is where the benefit of being in small and uh, you know micro and mid cap comes in because small cap or mic micro caps may not actually be tracked that much so you might have a company which might be growing five times in revenue in a year's time but people might not be buying it because not because it's not a great proposition because people haven't heard of it or they haven't tracked it so that and also like if they are let's say a thousand two thousand crores the large players will never invest in that because they will start looking at companies after they are like six seven thousand crores at the very minimum because the size they need to buy means they can't look at smaller companies for them and though that is where you can get real gems because you would have a company like there's one company in our portfolio where we know the mar you know the revenue will grow from say 25 crores in the first half of this year to almost 200 crores this year and 300 crores next year. So, you know, that kind of growth, once it, and it's profitable, and we've done a lot of research, we know that it is like, you know, happening. But the idea is that because we've gotten, we've already seen a 100% growth in that sector and in that company in three months. And we are holding because we think it's going three times from here. So... Yeah. So that, and sometimes you go sector down. So like we like the tire sector because of the raw material prices and all that. Then we went top down. We saw which companies make sense. Now, given that there was an EBITDA growth slated, if you pick up a company which already has a very high EBITDA, the impact on their part will be less uh, you know, visible. But if a company has low EBITDA and that is going to go up by 5%, so it's doubling, then your part will triple or four times. So that's a better company to pick up because that will show much more growth, which is what we did and which is what we saw. Right. So as an investor, can I start with 50 lakhs rupees, which is the SEBI norm, and then scale it up later? Or you look at some kind of minimum commitments before? No. So our point is, in fact, we say, you know, a lot of people who could invest a lot more invested 50 to begin with. And my point is, you know, try it out. See how it is. Once... Once, and we are confident about ourselves. So there are people who started with 50 and are at three plus today. They've literally kept, because the point is, if I perform, you know, you will invest with me. If I don't perform, even if you've invested, you'll be unhappy and you'll be taking money out. I anyway have been investing for a long time. So, you know, the fund is something which is a passion for me. And while it has been growing well, the thing is that, it is not something which I want people, I, I put my image in the fund. So I do not want a person to invest in me and then feel that, you know, he's been kind of, you know, hustled into investing more. So you invest whatever you are comfortable with. We, our average ticket size right now is about 1.7. So whoever's invested currently, if I look at the number of investors, it's about 1.6, 1.7 crores. But having said that, we do have people who started with 50 and, uh, you know, scaled yeah. up. So yeah. everything's possible. So a couple of uh, questions. Uh, we have another five minutes. So we'll sure. have sort of rapid fire. <laughs> so another question is, uh, uh, as far as the, the investment is concerned. So do you think this kind of alpha is sustainable uh, going ahead? So see, I, I have told you, I... If we look at the example on GDP growth, from 2 to 5 million, the three economies we did it all had 30 to 50, 40% IRR over the period. India is at 11%. So, you know, I would say in the medium to long term, 20% plus is definitely sustainable. I, If you come in with a view that 100% is sustainable, sorry, no. That's not sustainable. Uh, but 20% plus is definitely sustainable. Also, let's understand, you know, a lot of times people feel that uh, there's been so much growth, P's have gone up. Also understand, P also has interest rates as a factor. Interest rates in India, when we started out 25 years ago, were close to 13, 14%. Uh, 
the same thing today is at 7 8% so if your discount factor has come down your pe will go up so saying that you know 2008 mein this was the pe and now is wrong you know the you have to look at in, in interest rates in 98 2000 whatever so a lot of factors go in i still think with the way india is poised with all the things that are there which i talked about up front and with the money coming in uh, definitely you know this is the best asset class to be in but having said that if somebody says i'll invest if you give me 40% sorry i can't commit anything when i started out i told people i would they definitely aim at doubling your money in 5 years which is about 15% return we doubled in less than like around 20 months so i had spoken about 60 months we did it in 20 months and it can still happen still going strong but yeah. i would always say invest with a reasonable return because when you start thinking 50 you start selling off everything else there was one investor very close to me you know never invested in equity started then they saw great returns then they started saying okay shall i break the fd shall i i said please don't change your entire setup because you've seen this growth because you've basically seen the problem with a lot of people is they've seen one way move they've not really seen a serious uh, bear market even 2020 was not a serious bear market it fell and it recovered before people really realized what was going on bear markets are what happened in 2008 you know where a lot of equity you know you are literally people are wiped out etc so you should always work with a balanced approach if you are young yes i am 100% equity bull so i have been very bullish on equity and uh, but you know i have also gone through days where i would say shit man what the heck am i doing you know because when you see large uh, falls in your portfolio you need to be built to take that not everyone is so read your mind ashish once again is what can go wrong according to you because okay. from risk point of view you have to think and everybody is bullish about it in the economy i am not saying that other people needs to be bearish about it but what do you think according to you can go wrong so the biggest risk which people have is leverage if they lever up and are have, and have to stop out that's the biggest risk personally feel short term you could have hitches and what happens in 2 months nobody can tell 2 months 3 months 6 months nobody can tell 3 to 5 years definitely if you've got it right and you've invested right you are very likely to do well having said that there is one 5 year patch which i see in india from 2015 to 2020 march where the bottom of covid market gave zero return or maybe slightly negative but if you normally took uh, any and if you stayed invested after that you've made a lot of money so the point is if you don't stop out if you stay invested there is limited risk india is in a growth patch okay but since you've asked me a question risk could be one if there are policies which are made uh, let's say like for right now rbi and sebi are working towards a lot of restrictions for you know they are trying to clean up the system they are saying small cap mid cap too much froth so they want to they've banned jm from funding they might come down on leverage etc so in the short term i think these things could play out for a correction right but if that happens i would say that's one of the best things that the regulator is doing because that will make our market a lot more robust and set for much larger growth because if you look at fiis or overseas investors i've been there as well you know i've been sitting offshore and i know the psyche how it works when you look at countries what scares people is the regulation and the setup now if a country shows that they have cleaned up the system and made the market more mature and better then i have a lot more confidence in investing so short term yes it could be a negative long term great now yes if there is a us hard landing while it's looking increasingly less likely that could have a short term impact on india trump comes in and says he's going to put in 10% uh, import duty on everything coming into us yes that can have an impact on india you know there's some major war that flares up oil the factors are there but having said that do i really see anything major which is uh, a risk 
not really the one risk i was concerned about was continuity of uh, government uh, so I was very relieved after the state elections in uh, December. Uh, after that, I'm like quite comfortable that now there is very limited risk for the next five, seven years. We are in a very good spot. In fact, right now is a time where even though markets are high, I would say people should continue to invest or stay invested. Oh, great, great. So with that, we'd like to conclude the session here. Thank you. Ashish, once again, it was great interacting with you. Um, we learned a lot today about investing uh, through your eyes. So thank you so much. Sure. Let me just share our contact in case somebody wants to have it. No, so they will reach out to us and then we in turn, we have an empowerment with your team. Cool. Uh, and then we will... Uh, no problem. Uh, That's fine. Yeah. Or you want to do direct, uh, whichever it's way. Okay. No, no, it's fine. Yeah. As long as you get the contacts across, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So basically, it's nice talking way... to you, and I hope people find this uh, right. really useful. Yeah. So the way we built up the platform is that we work as a platform, you know, in a sort of interface between the manufacturer and the investors because sure. we try and analyze their risk overall and then basis that allocate funds. That's how we do it. Great. But thanks a lot. And I hope uh, people find this useful. That's, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye.